Um, and then I will post it on the YouTube channel. Um, I'll post it. I'll post this on the YouTube channel. So for the sake of the recording, this is the BioCreation Careers Workshop, and um, we are getting started right now. So the objective of this workshop, um, this came out of conversations that came out at the panel um, at the virtual conference last year, um, some conversations that we had, and we felt as a society, the International Society of BioCreation. Um, the executive committee and all the members of the society and participate participants in our in our community, we can assist um, by creators and um, with their career career progressions. So um, I've gathered some people together today who um, who work in by creation in different aspects, and all of you. So really, the goal of this workshop is to talk about ways that we can help each other with our career progressions, and we have a whole slide deck put together um, to discuss different topics with you, but. What we'd really like to do is have a conversation with everybody and always doing this in a virtual format is a little more difficult than gathering together in person. Hopefully, luckily next year we have an in-person conference planned in Italy, so we can hopefully discuss this more in person when um, we gather together next year, next April. But um, So we do have a slide deck prepared for you and we can um, happily present these slides to you. Also, I feel like if we want to turn this more into a discussion and steer away from the slide deck, that's absolutely fine. We we have the slides, we share them with you. So we don't need to go through every single slide in kind of a presentation mode if people want to jump in and, and discuss different topics as they come up. Um, or we can um, just present this work, these ideas and thoughts to you via our slides, and then um, we can always come back and reconvene later or continue discussions on our email channel or in Slack channels or, or when we see each other at different gatherings or however works best. Um, so yeah, with that in mind, just keep in mind, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask questions, put uh, comments in the chat. Um, and yeah, please feel free to uh, be part of this conversation. So um, this came about really, uh, like I said, uh, during the panel discussion at the, uh, the ISB virtual conference last year, um, we had panelists from different, um, talk about the different career paths and how they came about into their career and, and um, by creation and different aspects of the, of the job that they had. And the panelists pointed out that um, one thing, there was no standardization of job titles, and maybe this is something that could help with career progression. And that's kind of what um, led me to think that we should have a workshop about this and thinking if we could collectively brainstorm and think about, um, should we have standardized job titles? And if we do, what would they be? Um, so for example, what does a starting position look like? Um, what would a starting bio creator what kind of title would they have and what kind of qualifications would a, a, a junior bio creator have compared to a more advanced bio creator? So if someone's looking to get promoted, how do they differentiate themselves and say, I'm, you know, I've, I've acquired all these qualifications and skills, therefore I should be promoted to the next level. And what's the next level? What's the difference between someone that's called a lead bio creator or a senior bio creator? Um, we've noticed that in some um, preliminary work that we did for this workshop, we noticed that there's a lot of just, there's a lot of heterogeneity within the heterogeneity with the names for different roles of bio creators or different um, levels. So, and maybe um, so yeah, one thing we want to discuss is the slides. Oh, am I not sharing the slides? I'm not seeing them. Is anyone else? Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, can you see them now? Yep, see them now. Okay. It was just text that was on the slides. You haven't really missed anything. <laughs> um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, yeah, so um, um, oops, someone took control of my screen and okay. Um, I think someone has controlled my screen. It is not. Someone controlling. Is someone moving the mouse around? Could you please stop? Um. Okay. Let me go back to sharing. Okay. 
okay so sorry back to where we were um yeah so um and, and then the, in a workshop held by um uh, at the at a workshop at the local uk conference this year at the apicuron workshop someone raised the idea of creating an ontology of bio creator roles so this has come up a couple different times whether we need to have this kind of standardized names of job um, titles in in bio creation and then also we sent out a survey the last year um where we asked by creators um, for a variety of different questions, including what kinds of scholarly input outputs do they produce? And the responses um, came back with uh, kind of a, uh, some typical responses that we would expect, like the bio creators, of course, produce curated data sets. A lot of creators work in like, academic roles where they do conference papers or peer-reviewed papers and give talks and posters. Um, also, a lot of curators work on ontologies and contribute to ontologies or develop ontologies for use in different um, curation systems and develop software um and we also um from the survey results we saw that um bio creators do play a lot of leadership leadership roles in various capacities but only half the respondents noted that they had been promoted during their careers so this is another kind of thing that we thought about for this workshop is that if we're we're doing a lot of work we're producing a lot of scholarly outputs but we're but only half of the respondents that reported to us are getting promoted so is there some way that we could better track our research and our um, our work and kind of get more credit for the work that we do. And the idea of being promoted is definitely something that, you know, it's beyond the capacity of the, the society, but something that we can advocate for ourselves um, within our job places. So um, so this whole idea of having defined titles for bio creator has been, bio creators has been mentioned and it was also mentioned on our um, on our mailing list and Alex Bateman, who was a former member of the ISB executive committee and, and was the chair of the EC, um, responded that he was uh, had a, an opposing opinion about um, having defined titles for bio creators. So um, he asked if it matters that we have a, a diverse range of job titles. And he says, no, you still find um, this in most fields of work. And he said, is bio creator a useful term for job titles? He says, it's, he's feeling it's not useful or widely understood or very marketable. Um, and then if there's any real world applications of having an ontology of bio creator job titles or roles to help with, um, <laughs> he said, bio creators will no doubt come up with something because they're clever, clever people, but I remain skeptical. I think as bio creators, yes, our, um, a lot of our inclination, we're, we're, we work to standardize data, so why not standardize our, our job titles? But um, I, I like that Alex brought up this kind of opposing opinion. So this is something we should think about. We could make an effort for us as a group to talk about standardized job titles, or maybe we don't need them. Um, but yeah, so during this presentation and this this workshop today, um, we can think about this. And I don't think we'll have time in this actual workshop to, I was thinking initially that we could brainstorm in this workshop together different titles if we thought that that was necessary or useful. But I think we have actually put together quite a bit of content, so I don't think we're going to have enough time to do it today. So we propose that we just do that virtually if we think that's really something that's use useful and worthwhile to do. Um, of note, I only scheduled this workshop purposely for an hour, and I feel like we have more content to talk about than an hour, just since we're also Zoom fatigued and uh, the virtual format is a little more challenging than actually talking together in person. So maybe if we um, still have things to discuss afterwards, we can always schedule additional calls or we can always reconvene and we meet in person in Italy next year, um, whatever people want to do. So yeah, no, now I'd like to introduce um, my co-presenters for this workshop and our um, my co-organizers. Um, so yes, the um, five of us came together to put together these this content and um, they will each individually introduce themselves. But um, just briefly, I'm Nicole Vasilevsky, as I mentioned, and I'm based in um, Portland, Oregon, but I work for the University of Colorado. We have, and I'm currently the chair of the executive committee for the ISB. We have Randy Vida, who is also on the executive committee, and she's based in San Diego at the La Jolla Institute and um, works for the immune epitope database. Marianne Tooley is um, with Giga Science, but based in the UK, is also on the ISB executive committee. Christy Holmes is at Northwestern University and um, is the uh, university librarian. And um, Christy and I met through collaborations through Eagle Eye and Vivo and um, through Force 11. And Mohammed Hosini is also at Northwestern University as a postdoc with Christy. And I met um, Mohammed through Christy and Force 11. And um, uh, we're each going to individually give a little bit more background about our 
our qualifications and our career path just to give an idea of some of the diversity and kind of heterogeneity of kind of the work that we do and the titles that we have. So I'm at the University of Colorado, so I work in an academic environment. My official title at the university is visiting associate research professor, and I'm currently going undergoing the promotion process to drop the visiting um, uh, label and have it just become a, a proper associate research professor. My unofficial title, my title within my group, I'm part of the um, Translational and Integrative Sciences Lab um, with Melissa Handel, and my title within my um, department is lead bio creator. And I work on a lot of different projects within um, the TIS Lab, the Translational and Integrative Sciences Lab, uh, mostly um, semantic technologies for um, coordinating disease to phenotype um, annotations. And I do a lot of ontology development. And some of my um, career path is I came on um, with Melissa in 2010, so it's been over 12 years now as a scientific. My first title was scientific data creator within our group. And then I um, and I'm in a promotion within OHSU where I was previously to Colorado. And now I've been called the lead, the lead curator since, um, since 2016. And I've had different academic titles um, in my, posi my positions at my academic institutions now at the um, associate research professor level. So with that, I'll let Marianne introduce herself next. Unmute myself. Uh, hello, Marianne Toobie here. So I currently work um, as a data editor um, for GigaDB, which is part of the Giga Science Press um, journal, set of journals. Um, so I'm a, I'm a cu uh, curate, da data editor at the moment. Um, so my career path, um, there's five bullet points there, but in actual fact, there's been only three positions. So it sort of reflects exactly what we're talking about today. Um, so there was, my first position was as in what we called annotator um, back in the last century. Um, and that was in Emble in Heidelberg. So that's where I started. Um, and then when the Emble database moved over to Hinkston to the genome campus, I went as well and became the curator coordinator. Um, and then one issue that is, um, has been an issue for curators, especially that work in EMB, um, EMBL is that they have that nine year maximum time that they can work um, and that's that's an issue that's it's always it's always been there and that's something we might want to discuss so then I, I moved um, stayed on campus but moved to Wormbase where I was um, a senior computer scientist by curation and then for administrative reasons um, I then moved to Caltech but um, I'm based in the UK Caltech is on the other side of America so I, that's when I started working from home um, and Interestingly, I was doing exactly the same thing. I mean, give or take, obviously I developed within, within my role, um, but I was, one, I was a database curator and before then I was a senior computer scientist. So it was fitting in with the staff, with the roles within those different institutes, both in Hinkston and in, at Caltech. Um, and then I jumped from bio curation to uh, public, public, from, sorry, from, um, model organism database, worm based to publishing. Um, and that's where I've been for the past five years. So that's that's a whole different sort of world there. That's it. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, next we have Christy Holmes from Northwestern. Okay, great. Hi everyone. It is such a pleasure to join you today and be part of this workshop. The conversations in preparing the workshop were um, a lot of fun, so I'm glad that we're finally all here to, together. Um, so my current role at Northwestern University is I am the director of Galter Health Sciences Library and Learning Center. We have an extensive, um, I guess, portfolio of research data um, services and resources in addition to some of the more traditional things that you might think of when you think of libraries. Um, I'm also a professor in preventive medicine in the Division of Health and Biomedical Informatics and work um, extensively with our like AI and machine learning activities on campus in addition to just thinking about infrastructure. Um, it's on that topic that I think um, I've really been able to hear some interesting things just in preparation here and also looking at the great resources from 
um, the group around the curator role in um, because I think that there are that role is something that a lot of people are thinking about and wanting to um, you know to be able to do more intentionally and have as part of a, an active and productive team. Um, I started out, my background's in biochemistry and chemistry. Um, I got a role as a bioinformaticist doing research data um, analysis and visualization at Washington University and then was recruited to Northwestern. So that's how kind of how I, my um, little um, journey that I took that's not exactly straight. Um, the work that I do now really focuses a lot, um, certainly in thinking about information structure and infrastructure, but also um, this idea of clinical and translational science and the role of information, um, uh, contributor roles, thinking about evaluation and continuous improvement, and then also data sharing and open science in the context of that. So um, I'm uh, really pleased to join you today and look forward to the conversation. I think Mohammed's next. Thank you, Christy. So um, again, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Mohammed, and I'm a postdoc at Northwestern University. Um, my background is in ethics and applied ethics. Um, I've been a researcher, teaching assistant uh, in the Netherlands. I was a PhD candidate and a lecturer of ethics in Ireland. And I've been here in uh, Northwestern since um, September last year. Um, my main area of research is on contributor roles. So in relation to the, the topic of the workshop, I mainly look into how different research roles, such as, for instance, bio curation or data curation, are reflected in different um, output types, such as, for instance, um, peer review journal articles or um, data sets, and how these can be uh, how how these can become fairer and more transparent. Um, and that's about it for me. Thanks, and Randy. Oh, unmute myself. Um, I'm Randy Vida. Um, I work at the Mutant Epitope Database. Um, I, I've been doing this since 2005, so it seems like forever. So I work at a nonprofit research institute, um, which is an academic setting at the Hoya Institute, and we have about 400 employees. And our project is NIH and IAID funded, so we have a contract, so we have a stable public resource. And our um, curation effort is literature creation, so our curators read uh, publications and take all of the data out of it and put it into our uh, database, which is a public resource. And so our unit of curation work is a publication. Um, now we have a team of eight full-time curators and two part-time curators, and um, they're all subject matter experts. So they have to be immunologists first and then data curators second. And we are currently hiring. So if anyone's interested, we are always looking for more curators. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a big team. Um, and so I started off originally as a data curator. Um, we only have two curator titles at our institute, scientific curator and senior scientific curator. So after a curator's been there a while, uh, they start uh, they become good at it and then they start reviewing other curators work. And so that's when you become a senior curator. Um, uh, then um, I went on to be a senior curator and then a data quality control and assurance manager, very long title. And that was because I started working with the data values themselves and with the database and ontology development, like Nicole had mentioned. Um, so I do a lot of data standards and trying to make the creation interface uh, more consistent and user friendly and also um, linked to ontology terms rather than in free text. And then since 2017, I've been lead ontology quality manager and that just reflects more um, work with ontologies and less work with actually curating. I think that's it for me. Thanks, Randy. Um, yeah, so we have an outline for the conference, and I'm I'm trying to monitor the chat and read all these great things that people are saying. So um, we are 23 minutes past the hour, so we have 37 minutes left to discuss, and we really want this to kind of be what you all want it to be. So we have a lot of content here that we can talk about, but if we rather just kind of make this open discussion too, we are um, totally happy to do that too. Or we can just go through these slides and. Um, Please feel free to chime in whenever um, any questions arise. It, um, I'll try to monitor the chat, but please also feel free to just um, unmute yourself and and um, just and talk along. Oops. Um, so yeah, what we have put together for today, as we looked at all the different 
Um, we tried to look at a, a bunch of different job titles and roles. A lot of this came from the survey data that we collected before. We also looked at um, current job openings that were posted on the ISB website and just to look at the kind of heterogeneity of titles and roles. Um, Mohammed has put together some really nice slides about credit and attribution, about ways that we can try to get better recognition and credit for the work that we do and some um, standardized ways that we, um, we can do that. Um, we also have um, di different scholar, um, just, well, we also have a slide about discussing color scholarly contributions of bio curators and how to get better attribution and credit for these. And then um, we have an overview of different ways to track metrics and share scholarly products. And um, we did, I do have a document where we can, we, if we decide this is something we'd like to do is collaboratively, co collaboratively draft a document on the different bio creator career levels and paths. Um, looking at the chat, Val had a nice comment about, um, or was it, um, there was a comment, um, oh, Sue suggested that it might be um, interesting to collect the varied titles and then the types of responsibilities that go with that title too. So that's also, I love that idea. I think that could be really useful too. Um, and then as an outcome of this meeting, we could um, do various, uh, there's various um, things that we can do as an outcome of this meeting. And I outline these here in this slide. So we can write up a report and create and or create a web page with these resources on our website. So if we do end up with like a list of potential standardized titles or titles and um, responsibilities, this is something that we can um, publish in a, um, in a paper or, and or on our website. Um, we could end up with a list of standardized roles for bio creators. Um, we also thought there may be interest in having some kind of follow-up workshops or meetups at future meetings to go um, to review our, our, we can also review our CVs and our bio sketches and think about the work we do and how we can better um, promote ourselves and, and our positions. We can also have future workshops or discussions about how do you get a job as a curator? How do you write your resume and CV? Or also it's brought up in the chat too about um, promote uh, uh, the idea of um, transitioning from um, academia into industry or vice versa, uh, transitioning your job. That's also something that we could try to talk about um, either today or in the future. Um, we also have sub subject matters that subject matter experts that have expertise, but how do we know if they're good curators, like curators? How do we, how do we recognize the skills and curators as potentially in hiring curators too? Um, Another thing we could potentially do as an outcome is write up a job description for a curator. And um, also one thing that we talked about, we did have a lot of um, pre-planning um, meetings for this workshop. So we had a lot of discussions already. And another thing that we were wondering is how do we, um, how do we know how long job um, bio-creation jobs are open? Are these positions easy to fill or are they staying open for a long time? Because people, I still feel like in all the years that I've been a curator, bio-creator that it's still a really um, kind of new field and people don't always, when I tell like people that I meet or friends and family what I do, I feel like the majority of people still don't really understand what a bio curator is and what I do, even talking about scientists too. So um, those are other questions that have come up and perhaps we can um, think about as an outcome of this workshop. So um, just have a few slides to share with you about um, just looking at job titles that um, we, um, aggregated from the survey that we sent out last year. So, um, so yeah, like I said, there's a lot of heterogeneity with about job titles. Um, a lot of people are just called bio creator in some form or another. A lot of like we have managers, project managers, ontologists, bioinformaticians, um, other kind of variations on curator names. Um, some people just have like academic titles, like um, research associates or uh, postdocs, and um, principal investigators and such. But yeah, there's a lot of kind of heterogeneity amongst the um, the titles that are used. And then we also looked at the um, current titles and the job postings that we had on the website. Um, this was post, this was done, um, I don't know if I put the date on here, um, like uh, last month. So um, at the time we had quite a few job openings posted. And if you are looking for a job or interested or posting a job, um, this is the website where you want to go. But um, looking at the current job titles and the postings that we had um, up on the website last month, there's kind of big um, kind of smattering of different types of titles amongst the different jobs that are that were available at the time. And I kind of tried to categorize these on the right into kind of broad categories that so we have things like data wrangler and bio creator, bioinformatician, but also a lot of different other kinds of um, variations on the same kind of um, and the uh, variations on the, on, the, on the different types of jobs that, that are available. 
And then we also looked at um, the various job titles for um, different some of the different groups that we have, have that we've liaised with with our um, through the society. So um, looking on the left, if we look at industry jobs, we see um, similar stuff that we saw kind of listed on the job openings and, and then the survey results where we have um, people called data curators, um, team leaders, data modelers, et cetera. At Genentech, um, Rama is on our um, executive committee. She said that everyone in Genentech then the curation team is just called data curator. They don't have any kind of ranking. Um, at SciBite, they do have some kind of ranking where you go from scientific to senior to lead. Um, and Elsevier, one of the publishing outlets, um, they have they don't have a specific title if anyone called a curator, but they have a um, big uh, range of titles that they assign to their people who do sort of curation type of work. Um, at Randy's um, uh, project and, and her organization, they have either scientific curator or senior scientific curator. Um, in my in my group, which is also an academic group, um, we have kind of a range of, of titles. Um, I would say that there's really only um, directly in my group, there's only two of us who are actual proper curators, and we have the bio creator and then the lead bio creator. And we were wondering if maybe do we need some kind of range of titles like they have in, in wet labs? A lot of us came from um, bench research and academic research or um, research in companies and and the, and the vet lab seems to have a kind of a more structured um, hierarchy of, of titles where you have research assistants, associates, and scientists, and then you have different levels from one, two, three, and senior within each of these. Um, so, and then when we asked in the survey about the different roles, so people could have a title like my title at my in my group is the lead bio creator, but I do have a lot of different roles. So I do a lot of different things. So I do I do a lot of creation, but I also do a lot of ontology development. But my official title is an ontologist, and I'm also uh, my official title within the university is uh, associate research professor. So it's kind of all over the place. So looking at the roles, which are different from the actual titles, we see kind of a lot of different things, but a lot of uh, common commonalities like computer biologist, informatician, ontologist, data scientist. We have a lot of program project manager. Um, type roles as well. And with this, I'm going to turn this over to Mohammed to talk a little bit about contributor roles. So this is um, a way that we can help try to get some more recognition for the different roles that we play. And, they can, and the roles also can vary project to project. It doesn't always have to be um, like you're always just in one role. The roles are kind of more fluid. So with this, I'm going to turn this over to Mohammed. He's going to talk to us about uh, contributor roles. But I guess before we um, before we switch uh, gears a little bit, do, does anyone have any questions that they want to bring up? I see a lot of activity in the chat, but does anyone want to, want to talk about anything before we uh, continue on with the slides? Okay, well, I'll turn it over to Mohammed then. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, can I just share my screen? Excellent. Um, slideshow. Okay. I hope that you can see this. Um, so this is this is my research, which is basically about contributor roles and how um, various different um, uh, contributions to research are reflected in publications. Um, as you can see, there's like um, badges for, uh, there's specific roles called, for instance, investigation. Data curation is in the list of some of the most important taxonomies, which is Good news, because some uh, research roles are not there. For instance, if you're doing community engagement or if you're a librarian, um, your role is not really often reflected. Um, but data curation is one of those. But for me, is also one of the most important ones and interesting ones because it is um, very heterogeneous and it involves so many other specific roles that makes it very difficult to capture in published um, research items. Um, so how do these um, show up? Let's say this is this is a paper um, on sleep disturbance. Um, we have a list of authors. This is just published very recently. We have a list of authors. This person, Roland um, von Connell. Um, we can see. We can click on their uh, on the authors uh, tab, and we can see. Okay, what has been their contribution? They have been involved in the role of conceptualization, formal analysis, funding acquisition, investigation, methodology. And you know these are um, all standard roles um, that uh, have been designed by this group of people called um, the, uh, that are now actually part of NISO, 
Um, this is the credit taxonomy, which some of you might have heard about it. It has 14 roles. Um, one of them is actually data curation. And each of these roles come with a definition. Um, the definition that is provided by data uh, for the data curation role is basically management activities to annotate or produce metadata, scrub data, maintain research data, um, including software code where it is necessary for interpreting the data itself for initial use and later reuse. Now, from what um, just Nicole was discussing and what she showed, I think um, uh, I'm actually quite interested to know whether um, you think this definition accurately captures what um, um, bio curators or someone who's um, getting the role of, uh, is hired by the role of a data curator um, um, is doing on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, thanks, Nicole. There's a poll. It would be great if you could uh, just share your uh, perspective. Uh, do you think this is enough? Do you think we are missing something or um, you're just unsure? Um, this is one way of capturing uh, what has uh, happened in the research process. Another, there's also another taxonomies and ontologies. Um, for instance, um, this is uh, the one that um, I think Nicole and Christy um, and a few others have been heavily involved in developing it. Um, this is one, uh, it's called contributor role ontology, which has like, especially for data role, it is a lot more granular. Um, for instance, here for data roles, we have data aggregation, data collection, metadata application, data entry, and so on. Um, whether this is a better um, reflection of what data curators do or not is one thing, but how these um, different roles end up showing um, in, 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 in a published item is a whole different um, question. So to keep it short, I'm going to um, show you three specific examples of journals, sorry, journal publications that I found with the role of data or some data aspect. And I'm going to show you how some of the contributions made by you or someone who might be your colleague uh, at a whole a different domain or in a different part of the world has done, what their contribution is, um, how their contribution is being reflected in, in, in research publications. So the first one is, and I'm just going to, 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 to click and uh, you know go with the flow. So the first one, the first link is a very straightforward one. Published in plus one, um, we have, you know, we have the article here. Um, you can see I press on the authors tab and then I go search. Data curation, okay. I can see that the first and the second authors have been assigned with the role of data curation and another role, which is writing, review, and editing. Okay, so as someone who's looking at this, I now know that the first and the second person, sorry, the second and the third person have been involved in the role of data curation. This is very straightforward, and this doesn't happen very often, as I will show you in the next example. The next example, the second one, is also published in PLUS One, um, has, well, a couple authors. Um, two of these authors are assigned with the role of data curation. Um, this person and this person. So, so far, so good. However, we also have another person who is mentioned in the acknowledgement section, who is not an author. So this person, William Standard, is not an author, but their contribution to data processing, well, if data processing could be anything, their contribution to data processing is mentioned in the acknowledgement section. Now, this paper is also attached to another artifact, which is a data set that is stored on the OSF. Here, we have three authors or three contributors, two of whom were also the authors of the paper, but then we have another person here that wasn't either in the authorship list or in the acknowledgement section. So while the first paper had only two authors, both 
uh, labeled with the role of data curation. We knew very straightforward who has done what, and things seemed a lot more clear. In the second paper, we have a range of, um, we almost have like different shades of acknowledgement and attribution, because some people are um, authors, some people who did data curation were listed as authors. One person was just um, acknowledged. They cannot really reflect that acknowledgement in a resume or in a CV. And then we have three other people who are also uh, named as a contributor of the whole data set. That is a whole different um, research item. The third paper, that the third example that I'm going to show you is even more interesting. Here, this is not, again, this is not biocuration. This is, I think, um, geology research. But the point is that it involves using data in research. Here, the author list mentions no one that has been involved in any data role. There is no one who has made a contribution to data as it stands here in the, in the, in the author byline. No one is also mentioned in the acknowledgement section, but the paper has another artifact, which is a data set, is a large data set that is stored here. And most of the people who are mentioned as author are also authors of the data set. This is one data set. The other data set is here. So the data is stored in two different places with names of most people who have been authors. But when I look at the paper, I cannot see who has done what. And this is quite interesting because the paper has a whole section on data processing. Um, and I think this shows, yeah, acoustic data collection and collaboration. So acoustic data processing, There's there's been so much happening with data during this research process that is not captured in any shape or form. And the point that my research is trying to investigate is, okay, um, if so many people have been involved in a data role, how can we know who has done exactly what part of it? And in a case like this, how can these people actually reflect these contributions in their resumes and in their CVs? I'm sure a lot of you have uh, similar experiences. Um, and this is just three specific examples. Um, so with this, I would like to um, go back to the slides and um, hand it to, um, to Christy. But um, if it is the case that uh, the group decides to have further conversations about this, um, I'm happy to be involved in it. Um, and I'm happy to provide input if, you, if it is a belief that my input could be useful. Thank you so much. And um, yes, Christy, there you go. Thanks, Mohammed. Chris, do you want to share your screen or would you like me to? Um, it would be great if you could. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, here we go. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to, this is just a brief pit stop <laughs> to talk <laughs> about how we represent our, um, the work that we do on these kind of formal things like a CV or a biosketch or something. So typically in a CV, we know the kinds of things that tend to show up here, you know, grants, publications, presentations, and so on. Um, but when you think about the work that all of us are doing, it's much more nuanced than that. We're creating a wide range of scholarly artifacts and um, you know, producing knowledge that can be consumed in different ways. And so um, the middle block of text really just outlines a few of these examples. Each one of these types of research outputs um, reflects something that is an important important component of that work. And it's also important in the context of, you know, helping to support reproducible research, right? So you can't just have a summary paper, you need, oh, I'm sorry, I can't see the slides. Um, sorry. So you can't, no, that's okay. So you, you can't see um, the, um, you don't see this in like a typical journal publication. And so that's an important part of that. The other thing just to share is um, that there are also a number of roles and that idea has been, I think, talked about quite a bit, you know, that um, the representing the work that we do on projects um, can be much more nuanced as well. Um, next slide. So just briefly, um, uh, Mohammed mentioned the credit taxonomy. So this is a um, representation of contributor roles. It's often used in publishing, but it shows up in a number of other places as well. 
Uh, and I wanted to show you how it, um, descriptive work about the things that you're interested in and accomplishing um, in your professional activities can be represented here. So here we have um, a, a curator, someone who is involved with bio curation. They're doing a couple of different types of things. I wanted to show a couple of different examples. Um, so there's a lot of uh, biomedical ontology and data standard development. Um, work that's happening. Um, there are some uh, some phrasing here to show you how you can add context and um, a little bit of um, uh, like quantitative context to this, but also the qualitative in terms of describing the roles of this person. Um, on the second one, one of the things I wanted to point out that Mohammed alluded to earlier is this idea that outreach and engagement, which is an incredibly important part of the work that we do in science is not represented in these standard um, ontologies. And so if, um, for instance, our um, bio curator colleague is involved in, um, let's see, so she um, worked on developing some uh, layperson accessible um, content that could be used uh, by um, patients and their caregivers right um, but there's no way to really contextualize the production of those materials or the outreach activities uh, in the context of this kind of an ontology or taxonomy so um, just to show that you know sometimes these narratives can be a really effective way to communicate this information whether it's in your bio sketch or um, cv or whatever those those little bullet points to help to add context really help the reader understand um understand you better so um with that i am going to pass it over to the next speaker can can i add something this is sushma please yes uh, so from an experimental biologist perspective, uh, I have been used to that author order in the paper actually indicates their relative contribution and exact contribution or role of different authors uh, was not spelled in a lot of historic papers. So this is a very recent feature. And I think the scientific community uses the author order and uh, minimally, uh, and they describe the contributor's role to a very minimum in the paper. So that practice of expanding and spelling out everything is kind of evolving. So right. this is just two, two things I wanted to add. No, I definitely agree with that. There's also dis discipline specific reflections here. So we can still have people who are doing biomedical research and it's less uh, less critical. The first and last positions uh, mean different things in different <laughs> fields. So um, it, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I think just having mechanisms to be able to better represent, for instance, I'm the first author because I did the majority of the experiments, I wrote the first draft of the text, and you know those types of things really helps to um, describe that. But um, these kinds of these kinds of phrasing, anywhere where you write a block of text or where there's an opportunity to add a sentence or two of context can show up here. So the contributor role, I mean, um, sorry, the contributions to science section in an NIH biosketch would be a good place. Um, in a um, grant proposal, they're often, or like um, the justification text, you can add a little bit of context here to help to show someone's expertise, um, the recognition of that expertise. And also what we tend to do here is we also show it in comparison to the rest of the field. So, you know, looking at comparative benchmarking, which I did not put here um, since I'm this, a lot of this is not real numbers. Great, thanks, Christy. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any other comments about the, um, the contributor roles and different ways that we can kind of um, highlight the work that we do. Um, yeah, please feel free to continue the discussion or, or post things in chat. There's been lots of great conversations in the chat. Um, this next slide is just showing um, some work that 
Um, we did at a conference and when we were in Shanghai, we had a workshop in person um, that Randy and I led. And Randy, do you want to speak to this slide about this generic job description that we created? Uh, sure. So people have asked about this in the chat about what are the skills that a biocurator has and what should they put on the resume? So this um, survey that uh, Nicole mentioned, we asked people, what do you do to come up with the guidelines for what a biocurator does? So we use those that input to create what we thought was a good generic job description, but there is um, quite a bit of difference. So the first thing, the subject matter expertise, typically PhD, and this also has come up in the chat that people are asking, what if I'm not a PhD, but I have experience doing biocuration, then I think you should definitely feel comfortable applying uh, because it's, depending on exactly the project you're working on, sometimes a PhD is um, absolutely critical, but sometimes your biocreation skills are more important than the PhD. It depends on what that uh, project is willing to teach you on site, because most of our PhDs, when they started, had no biocreation skills, and we had to teach all of them. So um, we're definitely open on my side to hiring people who aren't PhDs. And uh, there's usually a reason that someone puts that on the job description, but I don't think people should think of it as a barrier. That's just my personal opinion. Um, the ability to collaborate and work in a team, I think that is, goes without saying that I think most jobs require that. And then the ability to define and refine rules and standards, the data standards, and someone has mentioned fair data standards is a good example. So if you have experience with fair data standards, definitely put that on your resume, if you've standardized anything in the past, put that on your resume, because that is something biocurators, uh, that people that are hiring biocurators look for. Um, being able to communicate well with computer programmers, bioinformaticians and biologists alike is also very important. Uh, many of the jobs do ask for programmers, but many of the jobs don't need programmers, but you will probably be interacting with them. So if you have experience working with them, you may not think to put that on your resume, but it is uh, a specialized task. Not everyone is good at communicating with people in other fields. And most biocurators, either if they're not a programmer, will need to work with a programmer. And there is special skills with that. And then um, interacting with the stakeholders of the data, the people who created the data. So uh, many of the people we um, end up hiring actually had created the very data that's in our resource in the first place. So that's how they, we know that they understand the data. They are data creators. So even if you're looking at a biocreation as a desk job, if in the past you created that type of data, if you interacted with that type of data, or maybe your data is in their resource, that is a qualification for understanding the data and does make you more marketable to the people hiring. Um, and, and that also goes to the next one, um, demonstrate exposure and understanding of what's in that resource. So here we have natural organisms and how they're related. But again, it depends on what type of resource you're looking for, into. So if it's uh, a fly database, your research doing working on flies is relevant. It shows that you understand the data that's being talked about. Understanding the latest technologies and storage of biological data. So that's definitely changed over the years and it's constantly changing. So keeping up to date with that is important and putting that on your resume is useful. Um, experience in uh, working on yourself, self-training, because there's a lot of independent work. A lot of the projects um, have a smaller number of people, so you may be needing to wear many hats and figuring out many things on your own. So finding a way to put that into your resume is useful. Um, experience, collection, storage, transformation, standardization, harmonization, analysis of legacy data in lots of formats. So I think um, most of us, especially if you've been around a while, we've worked with lots of different formats and we've seen the format of choice change and the uh, database types change. And even if you say, say you worked on uh, Oracle before, that's relevant to a MySQL database and vice versa. Um, any experience you've had with any data formats, it's not something I normally would have thought of to put on my resume, but if it's something that the job you're looking for is using, then that is interesting. And, and they may not put something like that in their uh, job description. So, but if you have experience working with any um, types of databases or formats, put that on your resume for sure. And then um, common data wrangling struct. I don't think I know. Oh, programming languages. If you have any programming experience, any programming language, interest in programming, even if you're not a programmer, um, that is useful to put on there. Uh, many biocurators are self-taught programmers because they start off being a biologist first and then um, they learn the programming as needed. 
or vice versa. If you're a programmer and you're interested in bioinformatics and learning more um, biology related skills, uh, that still makes you very marketable. Um, experience in the creation of metadata for curated data sets. So again, if, if you deposited data sets yourself or if you have annotated anything, if you have years of experience doing annotation, definitely put that on your resume as mentioned earlier. Life cycle of data and particular storage of data for later reuse on um, this is similar to before. Data licenses. This is something um, I think nobody would think to put on the resume, uh, but uh, many people don't even know what a license is. So if it's something that you're familiar with and you know different types of licenses, if you have experience deciding what license to use, um, that's something that is interesting and useful for data curation. Um, data types, definitely. Um, privacy laws, that's another thing. Um, there are a lot of laws related to data, especially um, human data, and it changes in different countries. Uh, different types of clinical data can be made public or not made public. So if you if that's something you're familiar with, uh, many other people will not be familiar with it and it is a marketable skill. Um, any knowledge of anything that relates to any of these subjects, uh, it may not seem like much to you, but if you're going to a new project and no one else there knows that, that becomes a marketable skill. So um, think about what you know that not everyone knows. And um, it is interesting and useful to the hiring people. And I think that one of the um, things that's come up in the chat is about HR. Um, anytime uh, you're, this is again, just my opinion. If you're um, applying for a job in bio and your resume has to go through an HR department that doesn't understand this field, um, that is more problematic than with a, you know, say a research associate, a lab person. Um, their skills are easier to translate on paper, which is the whole purpose of this um, workshop. It is hard to uh, communicate to an HR department what exactly um, a biocurator skills would be. So if an HR person read that you know something about privacy laws, they may not realize at all how important that is. So I think it's really important for people trying to hire biocurators to communicate effectively with HR or bypass HR and ask for all resumes be passed on. So that I think that's something when people are hiring, they should um, take the extra step and go directly to HR and explain that they wanna be really open with who they're looking at. Okay, that's all I have, Nicole. Thanks, Randy. Um, yeah, I also would like to point out that this is something that we put together um, when we were at the conference, I think it was in 2017 in Shanghai. And uh, so this, this is at least like four or five years old now. So if there's anything that should be changed or added to, taken away, revised, um, please feel free to bring that to our attention. And it's absolutely an opportunity for us to, to improve upon this. This isn't meant to be a stagnant document. It's kind of a, a living document. So we only have four minutes left. So um, we'll start kind of wrapping up. But this is um, a document that is a spreadsheet that I created where if we think this is something we want to pursue, we could talk, we could um, work on this either virtually, just kind of asynchronously, or maybe if we want to um, have some kind of follow up um, workshop or um, meeting online, like a working meeting, we could talk about um, the different potentially standardizing the different titles. And then I like, I really like the idea of, of linking the different skills to different titles or even just kind of inventory the different titles and then what skills do people have. So. I'll send a follow-up um, email in the next few days um, from this workshop, and uh, I will create a, like a survey um, that we can fill in, that we could say, yes, I want to pursue this, and then we can maybe try to coordinate amongst each other how to best pursue this and say, no, actually, this is a terrible idea. We don't need to do this, um, and, then, and then we won't. But I'm hoping that as an outcome of this workshop, we can kind of follow up on a lot of these ideas that have come up today. I just quickly want to Point your um, bring your attention to two other additional opportunities that are coming up. Where the first one is ongoing. The ISB offers these exchange fellowships for um, for anyone to go to another group and learn different biocreation techniques or methods and or experience different um, settings. This is um, was originally when it was originally conceived of. It was intended for like an in person um, exchange where someone would travel to another lab or group. Um, and now now that we're kind of back to uh, getting closer to before times and our normal, our normal expectations. Um, hopefully we can still have people, we can have people traveling to visit each other and meeting in person. So go to our website um, to look into that if you want to um, pursue other um, or learn other methods and um, bad creators or get to know other people. Also in, in a virtual setting, we have a workshop coming up next Friday that Muhammad is leaving, uh, uh, leading um, on the um, NISO credit tactosotomy. And um, we're going to have a session 
where we're going to de develop personas for curators uh, based on the, the kind of definition that um, that uh, Muhammad showed you earlier. So if you are interested in that, there's a link to the information there. So but yeah, like I said, we have um, two minutes left now, so I'll just wrap up. Um, there's a lot of different things we could do as next steps. Um, I, I will put together some kind of um, survey or form for us to fill out and think about um, what we want to do as next steps. Um, I love the conversation. I'll download the, um, the chat and share it with everybody and try to write up some notes about what we talked about today and put together a survey that we can get an idea of, of what we want to do next. I'm hoping that this is just kind of the beginning of the conversation and we can move forward and, and maybe create some actionable um, outcomes from this meeting where we could either you know, we can work on a paper, we can create standardized titles and roles and qualifications and, and share it with the community. Um, like I said, we're, the society is just kind of, this would be suggestions, we can't circumvent what HR departments are going to do, but we really wanna, as a society, really wanna help biocreators succeed in their, in their jobs and their careers. And we wanna help people enter the field and we wanna help people stay in the field and feel satisfied and successful. So, um, so these are some things that we can think about. And, um, and that's all I have. So I will, um, yeah, send the follow-up email with you all soon. And I really thank you all for, um, for coming and uh, feel free just to email the, the uh, biocreation email address and, the, and um, one of us will receive the email or triage, triage it to the right person. So feel free to follow up with any questions and we'll also be in touch um, with, and I'll share, I'll, this is recorded, so I'll share the recording with you all. And hopefully this will be the beginning of more conversations. Thank you all for joining. Thanks everyone.